Welcome back, Hidden History Happy Hour fans, for an encore of our special guest co-host, Mike Cole. Mike, welcome back. Good. Thanks for having me, man. Well, you, the votes are still being counted as we speak, but it is a lock that you are the fan favorite guest co-host that we've ever had. All right. Well, I'll take it, man. That's much appreciated. It's a good I mean, vibe. you're also the only guest co-host we've ever had, but still, it's, it's, uh, it's good. win, yeah. Easy, easy and way. fans, uh, it's great to have uh, Mike back. Alex will be back for our next episode. He's taken an absurdly long honeymoon, but uh, he'll be traveling back from some undisclosed location sometime soon. And in the meantime, it's our great good fortune to have one of our favorite guests back to host uh, with me, Mike Cole. Mike, I yeah. read your bio the other day. Uh, last week, um, you uh, American author, fantasy, science fiction, nonfiction. Now you're a historian, a bona fide historian, unlike... Uh, Alex and me, and uh, a, a real world cyber detective and intelligence analyst and author of, among other things, The Bronze Lie. And for yeah. people that want to get more Mike Cole, check out our last episode last week or episode 13 or episode 20. Welcome back. Thanks, man. It's good to be here. Hey, I got a couple of follow ups from our last episode. Uh, we were mm -hmm. eerily uh, prescient in, uh, in, in a couple of uh, strange ways. One, uh, you talked a lot about the the need for historians to get it right, even if right is boring. Mm -hmm. And to that end, I have a non TV recommendation for our fans, and that is Netflix's The Watcher. Are you familiar with this, Mike Cole? Uh, all I know is that it's horror, sort of, right? And that it's is it is it made by the same people who did Hill House or someone connected? No, to Hill House? no, no, not at all. And uh, good callback though, because last time we had a good conversation about Paul Tremblay's uh, uh, Head Full of Ghosts, yeah, which right. I finished after our last episode, scared the living crap out of me. So Stephen that's King true. was right about that. Yeah, um, no, The Watcher is the cast is unbelievable. It's uh, Bobby Cannavale, it's Naomi Watts, it's mm -hmm. Margot uh, Martindale. Uh, it's amazing. Mm. And unfortunately, however, it's based on a true story. Mm. And it's a New York story, Mike Cole. It's a story mm. of a family who buys a house, uh, you know, overextending themselves to buy the house. They move out of Manhattan into the suburbs to live their idyllic life. And unfortunately, the house is, quote unquote, haunted. Essentially, what happens is they start getting these letters, very nasty, scary letters from someone that calls themselves the Watcher. Hmm. prestige show great director great cast i don't know eight or nine episodes ends in a horribly unclear and boring fashion oh no then you find out the reason it ends in a boring unclear fashion is it's based on a true story and there's no actual ending to the story essentially the couple just moved out and they may or may not still be obsessed by what happened to them in the house but it it just it's like one of those things, remember in college when you keep a journal all semester and then you have to finish it the night before, you know, right. it's like that. And I can't right. believe even following your maxim of maxim of get it right, even if boring, they couldn't have done a little more with it. Well, I mean, look, uh, let, let's be clear here. When you're when you're doing actual nonfiction and you're doing a documentary, you know, that's one thing when your obligation is to tell the truth. And in some cases there, it's the selection of the story. Yeah. Um, the historian's work. Sometimes you may look at a story and you may say, I'm not writing a book about this or I'm not making a documentary yeah. about this because there isn't enough dramatic tension in this story to carry an audience. That's the kind of thing that you might want to publish in an academic journal. But from what you're describing, it sounds like the show was, it wasn't a, a documentary, right? This was sort of uh, like a- It's uh, based on a true story. Okay, well then in that case, it's on the director and the writing writer's room to make sure that that dramatic tension will start, from start to finish. There's no excuse for that. Yeah, and you'd think they could have run a title card at the end saying basically, hey, no one really knows how this story ends, so some liberties were taken. But by then, you know, the audience has had a satisfying experience, which I assure you, it is not. You know, there's there's been a lot of shows that kind of like peter out like that. That have been lost is one example. Uh, the yeah. X Files, another great one, where you get to the end of this long drawn out mystery, and you realize that the folks in the writers room don't even know what's happening, and they just yeah. can't close it. Look, endings are hard. They're really hard. They're really hard. I think in Hollywood, where a lot of stories are told by committee. Yeah, it's um, it's a disappointment. So you know, to recap our October slash November recommendations, uh, House uh, Head Full of Ghosts, definitely. Watcher, not so much. 
um, the Midnight Club, which is Mike Flanagan from Hill House and um, mm -hmm. Blair Manor, definitely. And again, I think I mentioned this last time uh, for next no, uh, October, maybe we'll have you back. Uh, he's doing the fall of the House of Usher, which could be really interesting. Oh, um, Poe is hard to pull off to a modern audience. I'll be interested to see what he does with that. Oh, I thought it was about the hip hop artists. No. Uh, well, anyway. <laughs> Mike Cole, this is going to sound like a random question, other than the fact that it comes in early November, what is traditionally referred to in uh, the Anglo-American community as the holiday season. But I promise our listeners and viewers, and Alex, if you're watching this on your honeymoon, it's not random. What, Mike Cole, is your favorite Christmas film? Oh, my gosh. You know, uh, I... Uh... I'm going to be kind of derivative in this, but it has to be Die Hard. It has to be the original Die Hard. It has Willis. to be the original Die Hard. Well, that's a that's a very prescient call. Um, <laughs> or you read the show notes before we started. One of the there's two. a lot of there's a lot of controversy over whether Die Hard is a Christmas movie, but I have no Abs argument on that topic. It is absolutely a Christmas movie. It is yes, as, as Mariah Carey's imminent arrival. Yes, well, you and uh, Alex will agree on that, but I will say. I am very eclectic in my Christmas movie taste. I like almost all of them. There is some stuff on the Hallmark Channel which can be a little cringeworthy, but I'm a sucker for a holiday film. I have to say, Elf. <laughs> Will Ferrell's Elf. I know. I mean, Elf is a classic. Elf is an absolute classic. I, I, and I I'm sad. I'm sad, Mike, because this will be the first year that we have to watch Elf in the absence of James Caan. Uh, who is no longer with us, R.I.P. Yeah. James Conn. Yeah. Still got Will Ferrell. That's what matters. It's got Will Ferrell. It's got an animated narwhal. Come on. <laughs> it's got perhaps Peter Dinklage's a greatest comedic performance. Uh, it's got everything, to be honest. No, Great soundtrack. No, Peter Dinklage's greatest comedic performance is, is the Space Pants short. What was that from? Oh. The Space, the space Pants one? Was it I don't Saturday Night Live? Possibly. Uh, what I remember about Peter Dinklage from Saturday Night Live is that you recall this. that... Um, I'm going to my phone. It keeps, it keeps yeah, pull off. it. Pull yeah. it up. We'll get back to it. Yeah. What I remember about Peter Dinklage from SNL is uh, I think Bobby Moynihan used to do a skit called Drunk Uncle, um, in which he played you know, the person at the holiday party who's always drunk and unwelcome. And then he had as a guest on his appearance as Drunk Uncle on Weekend Update, his cousin, Peter Drinklage. And this was Peter Dinklage, <laughs> drunk. And he had one of my favorite lines of all time. This was kind of in the early days of a lot of social media. And uh, so whoever was the host of Weekend Update says, uh, so Peter Drinklage, uh, have you updated your Tumblr account? And, and, and Dinklage does this. The only thing in my Tumblr is regret <laughs> for the record it was snl it was the uh gwen stefani episode and what's it called again space pants if you google peter dinklage space pants all of the list, all of your listeners and viewers can find the uh the short it's awesome all right fans we will put space pants in the show notes yeah and i will refrain from making the obvious connect the dot joke between Mike Cole's tight t-shirts and <laughs> the space pants uh, episode. So, On behalf of a grateful nation, thank you. <laughs> yes, indeed. So the reason I asked about your favorite Christmas movie is that the story we're going to tell tonight from Alex Dean's Lessons from History, the OG, not the uh, creatively titled More Lessons from History, which is still not available yet, Amazon in the United States, um, is called, in fact, The Die Hards. Now, Mike, uh, do you know about the diehards, not the movie, but the historical diehards? I do. This is uh, super, super late for my period. Um, but I do I do know that it's a particular regiment of foot that fought in the Peninsular War pretty famously. And the term itself coined uh, by their Scottish commander. Yes. So we're going to talk all about the context of the Peninsular War after I tell the story. And once again, fans, I am not going to attempt to paraphrase uh, Alex. I'm going to read verbatim. Actually, not from the lessons of history, but from the original OG, the 19th installment of, of hashtag Dean History on Twitter, in which Alex begins by agreeing with Mike Cole as follows. Die Hard is the best Christmas film, period. 
This truism is well known, but the phrase die hard actually has a much longer history. In the early 1800s, Spain and Portugal fought the Peninsular War against the invading slash occupying French. As usual, in any given scrap in the last millennia or so, the British were on board against the French. At the Battle of, now I'm going to butcher this, Mike, so correct me, Albuera. Albuera, that's right. right. Okay. At the Battle of Albuera, quite near the Spanish-Portuguese border in 1811, a uh, British and Allied force fought Napoleon's Armée du Midi, including some Poles from the Duchy of Warsaw. Now, Mike, with one my ignorance of... Yeah. Just one note on the French. Midi may, may give your um, listeners the idea that it's somehow the middle... Midi, it's the Army of the South. It's the Southern mm. uh, Army of, of France. Well, this is exactly what I was going to ask you, is to translate <laughs> that for us with regard to all of Napoleon's armies. But I have to say... This does put me in mind of something else that is hilarious. If anyone hasn't done this, Google uh, one of my favorite comedic actors, Paul Rudd, and just the word venti. I, I don't know where this thing comes from, but it is Paul Rudd attempting to berate the Starbucks barista about oh, no. their misuse of the term venti. So anyone who's ever been irritated by forced nomenclature at a beverage uh, location, check it out. It's funny. Paul Rudd speaks for all of us. He really does. In sum, says Alex, heavy losses on both sides result in a score of draw. Such conclusions belie, however, the human stories uh, between them. Major General Houghton was a British national hero. Two thirds of his brigade died in the line at El Buera, including Houghton himself. The French were able to enfilade, fire along the longest axis. And Mike, would this be akin to uh, a, a, a ship of war coming alongside another ship? Is that what yeah? We're so it's about? a broad, it's a broadside shot um, at, at a unit from the flank. That's and it's quite deadly. One important thing to remember about the Napoleonic Wars is that one of the um, combat, the sort of tactical differences between the Napoleonic armies and and, and the Allied armies was the the British tendency to deploy in line. This is fewer uh, ranks, more files, which allows more firepower to be brought to bear. Right. And the French uh, tendency to deploy in column, which allows less guns to be brought to bear, but a lot more punching power in hand-to-hand -hand combat, of which there was quite a lot in the early 19th century. So if you can get a uh, unit that's in line and enfilade, now think of that, you have artillery fire coming down the length, of all of these files, man, that's, that's a pretty bad hurt. Right. So you're, you're essentially deciding your tactics based on the likelihood that there is going to be hand to hand combat. Correct. And, and this is one of, well, or, or, or making your bet on what's going to uh, create a greater advantage, more, more bullets downrange. And of course, by bullets, we mean balls, right? Musket balls, not bullets right. that are used to in rifle weapons. And this, by the way, this, this sort of trade off between close combat and, and concentrating fire goes all the way back to the Thirty Years' War and the English Civil War as we come out of the, of the Middle Ages. And it really isn't until the development of the rifle, and the most famous unit, of course, being the 95th Baker Rifles, which the uh, British deployed during this time, really decides it in favor of, of more firepower and really sort of sounds the death knell for close combat. And rifle rifling meaning that your your shots are much more accurate, right? Correct. So rif rifling is the grooved interior of the barrel, right. and the and we now have the bullet shape, and this means that the bullet spins as it fires. Which um, I forget the name of the effect. There's a a, a term for it. it tumbles, um, yeah. Correct. Right, because if you have a smooth bore barrel and a round ball, you know you have differences differences in pressure to either side of the spear, and the bullet goes that way or it goes that way as opposed to if it's rifled, it's, it's going to it pretty much go straight. I know, Mike, that you're a military historian, so perhaps you didn't follow my international symbol for rifling, which is like this. And that is the international nonverbal uh, across uh, all military historians, so well done. Yes, thank you. So the French in this particular battle were able to, as I mentioned, enfilade fire along, uh, along their longest axis with a devastating hail of grape shot and canister. Tell us what the difference between grape shot and canister is. Well, I, I, I think that grape shot is sort of actual musket balls that are made for this and you're putting them all together into the barrel so they spray out like a giant shotgun. Canister is a, a thin um, shell of a canister and it's usually packed with just all the crap you can find, nails, chunks of glass, chunks of, of ripped scrap metal, 
but both of them are providing the exact same effect, which is a, a giant shotgun blast, uh, which is extremely effective against anti-personnel. And this this gives me a, an opportunity to mention once again one of my favorite movies, Pirates of the Caribbean, which I'm sure I mentioned last time, in which I believe they included like forks and yep. other silverware into their uh, what I guess you'd call grape shot. Yeah, but that's that's historically accurate, actually, for for uh, for canister fire. Anything you're going to jam down there uh, is going to do the trick. Well, just to be clear uh, for our fans, all I'm doing is justifying my drinking of Husser's Navy rum tonight because <laughs> it actually has nothing to do with this story. But it has to do with the other story I considered telling, and I decided not to. <laughs> I just got confused. Was this other story Churchill's excoriation of the Navy saying that it's all rum, sodomy, and the lash? <laughs> no, but I love that saying. I mean, I don't love it, but I understand it. Uh, no, it was going to be the last sailing ship of war, which Alex and I will get to uh, to do shortly, about the the uh, World War I fighting of a ship that had been built for the had been built for the sail age so we're going to get to that uh i did hear that one yeah any event uh colonel william inglis one of the many scots as you mentioned mike to have flourished during the empire commanded the 57th regiment of foot part of houghton's brigade he joined as an ensign and get this served with it since the american revolutionary war or as we like to call it the war of british aggression in 1781 so we can all imagine how it felt for Houghton, or sorry, for uh, Inglis, to see his 57th, his home and his comrades, his entire adult life massacred under him. Early on in the battle, a four pound piece of grape shot lodged in his neck. This is not good for you. <laughs> he refused to leave the field, staying with his regiment's colors as the battle raged and his line shrunk back towards him. Now, I'm going to interrupt myself here, Mike. We talked a lot last time about um, uh, the value of story and also the kind of apocryphal nature of some stories. Do, do we believe that he did get this hit and then stayed there? Right. I, I certainly do. Um, and there's a few reasons for this. Um, when, the last time we spoke, we were talking about the 11th century AD. Yeah. And it's, and so there's a few things there. A lot fewer sources survive for us to compare to one another, which is one of the great ways that you verify the truth of stories. And it's also before the printing press, which mm. vastly, vastly, vastly changes our access to sources and the number of sources that we can check, it, check against each other. By the time we get to the early 19th century, there really is a lot more reliability and a lot more proliferation of sources to use. Now, I am not gonna to pretend to be an expert on Napoleonic warfare and Napoleonic history. You also now have a press and you have a concept of objectivity yeah portage, which were concepts that did not exist uh, in the Middle Ages. So I am far, far, far more likely to believe stories uh, like this one. Um, I, I absolutely would defer to a professional Napoleonic warfare historian, but I think we're pretty safe in, in believing that this actually happened. Fair enough. All right. So as Colonel William Inglis lay dying, as he and others would have thought, that's a parenthetical. It's not air quotes, air parenthetical. <laughs> he called out to his beloved men again and again, die hard, 57th, die hard. For he and they would have thought that time was the end of them. All that was left was the question of how they died. And now I'm going to launch a pop quiz on you, Mike Cole, because Alex includes a parenthetical quote. Now, this is both air parentheses and air quotes. As if the way one falls down matters, exclamation point, close quote, quote. When the fall is all that's left, it matters, period, close quote. Do you recognize that? I do not. I don't either. I think it has something to do with Henry VIII, but we'll look that up and put it in the show notes. Obviously, Alex quoted it for some reason. I will continue. But surrounding their colonel, facing their end, the 57th fought ferociously, their concentrated fire repelling the French until they were finally relieved by other British forces. Now, Inglis became famous for his cry, and the 57th became known as the diehards. Inglis could not be operated upon until two days after the battle. Imagine, says Alex, the metal lodged in your neck for two days. Mm -hmm. But he ultimately recovered, fought in the Peninsula War again, was made a knight commander of the Order of the Bath, and in retirement was made colonel of the regiment in which he had served 
for over 30 years. And this is the true story, says Alex, of Die Hard. That's magnificent. You know, there is a wonderful painting. Um, if, you, if the, your listeners and readers go to the Wikipedia entry for the battle, it is not from this specific uh, regiment of foot, but it does show um, the British defending their colors against a troop of French lancers. I believe they're French lancers. They may be the famous Vistula lancers, which are the Polish unit that served on the French side. But one of the things that this painting conveys is this notion of being completely surrounded and sort yeah. of digging in with your last breath. It's, it's really a magnificent piece of art and will really convey the spirit of the story to your listeners and viewers. Yeah, we'll put that in the show notes and I hope people will check that out. I forgot uh, another follow-up from our prior uh, episode, Mike, uh, which is we talked about the false retreat, the feigned retreat. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, as we speak on November, stand by everyone, uh, 8th, 2022, <laughs> It's election night in America. Yes. There's discussion online about whether the Russians are feigning a retreat from Kherson in order to lure the Ukrainians into a trap. Do we have any thoughts on this? Because this will probably air after it's happened. I mean, I, I don't, you know, I, I don't want to claim to be a, a Russian uh, uh, expert on Russian doctrine. Um, but I've certainly never heard of them doing anything like that before. And in fact, with with Russia's morale uh, hanging by a thread right now, I think a fake retreat would be a pretty risky maneuver. I think what Russia needs to do at this point is to gain and hold territory if they want to if they want to prosecute the war. So I would that doesn't seem right to me, but I am definitely out on a limb speculating on this. Maybe it's a feigned feigned retreat, or even a feigned 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 retreat. It's it's because plan, it's plans within plans. It's the Matryoshka doll. Of Russian, yeah. you know what? What amazed me so much um, watching uh, Russia's early incursions into Ukraine was uh, them moving in convoy in tight urban areas, and the Ukrainians jumping out with javelin missiles and smashing them. And it's just, it's just like that doctrine of, of not keeping distance from buildings, of not covering blind corners, is urban warfare one on one. You remember just, that three mile convoy they had? Oh my God! What are you doing? You know, I mean, just get one A ten. That'd be the end of it. Uh, it just uh, it just amazed me. It made me think, wow, you know, their doctrine is they're, they're fighting field battles outside cities. This is Cold War doctrine. They haven't updated it for the for the whole counterinsurgency world that that we developed from our, our war in Iraq. Yeah, it's 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 astounding. I, I, you just have to believe, at least I believe that this was an entire ecosystem of people lying to each other. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and also just believing, uh, if I can say it, high in the smell of their own farts. You know, look, uh, <laughs> I, uh, I, I, I hope very, very dearly that Russia loses in Ukraine. You know, and, and the one uh, hope that I cling to when, when people get really, really nervous about the possibility of a nuclear exchange in that event is I keep thinking, look, uh, you know, major countries lose, nuclear armed countries lose wars all the time. The United States and Vietnam. Russia and Chechnya, uh, and nukes were not deployed in the past. So this allows me to, to at least hope, and, and look, I'll, I certainly can't predict the future, um, that we might, uh, we might yet uh, see Russia lose without, without that horrible outcome. And, and don't we have to be sort of, um, no pun intended, frozen at this point? I mean, it's, it's almost mid-November. How much actual on the ground, you know, tank APC-based fighting can they do between now and spring? They're going to destroy a lot of civilian infrastructure. They're going to commit a lot of war crimes. But what can really be accomplished now? I mean, I am not an expert on uh, on urban warfare in the winter in Eastern Europe. Um, I, I certainly don't know. I'd certainly imagine that if there are two armies that can that can fight under those conditions, they would be Ukraine and Russia. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's talk about something, Mike, called that you are an expert on, and that is CBS TV's Hunted. <laughs> <laughs> because I teased this last week and then we never got to it. So sure. this is how you and I met, right? We did not meet in uh, cybersecurity. We did not meet in uh, intelligence operations. We met because we were both involved with the CBS TV show Hunted. So what oh. is your Hunted origin story? Although I will say this, uh, actually, my, I'm not even sure of my Hunted origin story. I don't know how I got picked for the show. I have some theories, 
Um, but I do want to say that it was sort of cybersecurity, right, Brian? Because the, the thing that I wound up being selected for for that show was doing what we call GSM targeting, right? Yeah, yeah. Cell phones, which yeah. is really a, definitely a, a, a cyber orthogonal field. And with yeah. you in Gold Command kind of having to accurately simulate my capabilities and the sort of uh, legal hurdles I'd have to overcome to track fugitives, I'd say that was a cybersecurity gig for sure. But as for the origin story, the truth is, I don't know. All I know is that I was at a Christmas party for writers. I had had no intention of ever being on television. I had never even dreamed of it. I was, I was a writer. I wanted to be a writer. And I was at a Christmas party uh, for uh, writers in New York City. And I get a phone call. And the phone rings. And it's CBS. And they want to talk to me about being on a television show. And, and Brian, I'm not exaggerating. I looked at my phone and I went, fuck you. And hung up. Yeah. It would thought it was just a hoax, right? Yeah. I thought it was a joke, and they. I've called, had that. They, they, mm -hmm. they called back. I almost blew it, and uh, I heard, and I, and I, and I heard them say, "No, no, no, we're serious." And that's when I heard <laughs> one of my interviews in the background, and I thought, "Oh, oh, wait!" And I, of course, began apologizing profusely. To this day, I don't know how they found me. The only thing I can think of is CIA has a MoPIC office, right, which is a liaison with with motion pictures. Right. with Hollywood. And I was never undercover with the agency. And they were looking for, there's really sort of two kinds of fugitive trackers in the business. There's, there's, um, you know, fugitive recovery, which is what Lenny and a lot of the, the law enforcement right. side of it did. And then there's counterterrorism targeters, which is what I did. And I, I've got a feeling they probably like tried to get from both sides of the fence for that. And they probably went to CIA's MOPIC and I'm guessing that someone there was a fan of my books or something and knew I worked there and, th and they put me forward. And uh, that must have been how I got picked. Well, I have two things to say about this. One is um, thank you for confessing that you were never undercover. I'm looking at you, Valerie Plame. Uh, that's thing one. Thing two <laughs> is, uh, uh, you know, maybe somebody on this podcast Pushed them towards Mopic. I don't know. It could have happened. Could have, <laughs> well, could have, could have happened. Very grateful. Yeah, because it was an awesome experience. So there's so many takeaways from that show. Uh, I I think two of the funniest ones were that the I, my job was to try to make sure that the show was as realistic as possible. Number one, so we didn't give you guys any authorities that you wouldn't have had in the real world. And two, and honestly, this is a real thing to position CBS so they could defend themselves against lawsuits by people that claimed that we were cheating, right. that we just picked the prettiest couple or the most interesting, you right. know, characters and right. pushed them on. And that was my job. Like I got right. called in by very senior people at CBS to make sure that that happened. And they went, as you'll recall, they went through all these machinations to uh, position us physically so we couldn't interact with each other so my team the gold team that you referenced earlier we right. had cipher locks on our doors and we were all in the same but then they put us in the same hotel so right. we're all like in the bar for whatever 67 nights right. uh, ordering dinner and uh, eating uh together but i will say for anyone that's a skeptic and i think you know who you are the person that tried to sue us there was no <laughs> screwing around it was all legit the second thing I would say is, uh, Mike, you probably know there was a U.S. Supreme Court justice who once opined on the um, relationship between uh, police and the so-called neutral magistrate, the judges, for getting a warrant. And that, and that opinion said that even the most well-meaning law enforcement officers will always be in a zealous pursuit of their targets. Mm -hmm. And so we need a neutral and detached magistrate to make sure that when a search warrant or a, a, an intercept warrant is granted, that it's not just because we want to get the bad guys, it's also based on the Constitution. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I have never learned that lesson better than I learned on the TV show Hunted because you guys were pushing us 24 seven. Yeah. I mean, we'll think about grant it, that, these authorities. Right. Right. And actually there's a good example of this. We can actually go back to cybersecurity. Right. And this is actually what you want. You want specialists that are hyper-focused on getting their job done. 
And, and this tension that exists in cybersecurity in any IT infrastructure, you have operations whose job it is is to make sure that people can use computers to get their jobs. And then you have security whose job it is is to tie a cinder block to every single computer in the organization and sink it right. in the river because then right. everything will be safe and nobody will be able yes. to steal any data. Mm -hmm. And those two organizations relentlessly and single-mindedly pursue their, their aims against each other because they're diametrically opposed. And somehow they meet in the middle and you have banks and government agencies and they're all able to focus. But that kind of relentless commitment in the case of, of, of a law enforcement officer to getting the bad guy, right, any way they can, and to, uh, to magistrates, to, to government officials to make sure that the laws apply fairly and the rights are protected are necessarily adversarial relationships. Yeah. And they oppose each other and as they should, and in the end, when everyone's following the rules and the law is working correctly, right, there's no cheating. That's the one thing that has to be, you know, you have to uh, observe your limits and obey them, which good law enforcement officers do. Um, you get that meeting in the middle and it works out. I mean, look, it's all systems have flaws in them, but it, it by and large works out. Yeah, I mean, our system makes mistakes. And um, this is the principal reason I'm against the death penalty. I, I don't have any moral objection to it. I think... If you commit a certain level of heinous crime, the state has a absolute right to take your life. But the evidence is so unreliable, you know. Well, yeah, I mean, and, and, eyewitness and also, evidence is the most unreliable. And this is the this is the arguments I get into with other people because you know, having been in law enforcement now in the in the fire rescue community, where a lot of people are pretty pro death penalty, and my attitude yeah. is like, look, if there is a chance, any chance that even one innocent person could be killed then I'm out, you know, yeah, you can live, all, you can always that. let him out of prison later. If you screw I up, can't, I can't live with that. You know, I no, can't I, I, I'm a hundred percent with you, even though, yeah. I'm, you know, pretty hard ass prosecutor. I, my view is we get it wrong. You know, not the majority of the time, not even the significant minority of the time, but enough times that you want the person alive to reap the benefits of the DNA evidence or whatever it is. Yes. But yeah, uh, I, I will say, and I can't remember, if, I don't think you were one of these people, but a bunch of your compatriots in the um, pursuit staff on Hunted uh, would very frequently go to the showrunners and petition them to overrule my decisions on whether <laughs> a particular uh, technique was admissible. And uh, I, I was, I'm, I gotta say my appellate court review was a hundred percent. Look, I'll tell you, that was definitely not me. Uh, I, it, look, we talked about it as an historian. The thing, the important thing is to get it right, not to be right. And the same was certainly true uh, for my work in law enforcement. I, I definitely am a Dudley do right. And I definitely, uh, take that work incredibly seriously and and sort of wore it very heavily, I think, the whole time I was yeah. in. In fact, this is one of the reasons why I love doing firefighting now is that I'm in the emergency services side of it where there is no question. Yeah, you it's just, pretty black and white, right? You yeah. run in, you break down the door, you you do your search, you put the fire out, that's it. There's no moral questions about what you're doing at all, which is, I'll tell you, Brian, it's such an incredible relief. This is something that I, I want to say it's George Schultz. I might have this wrong, but somebody in my long career in government service said that one of the most frustrating things about Washington is that you never get an, a clear, crisp resolution of any question. It's always open to debate. And I got to believe that if you're fighting fires and you put the fire out and people don't die, that's a clear W like you're not, there's you, no you debating th that. You think that you think that, but you know, people are people and there's always, you know, did you do it right? Did you do it fast enough? Did you, you know, there's always attempts to make people laugh. Did you have the correct training? You know, people love to second guess calls and I hate to say it, but it's almost always people who do not act in emergency services roles are not being yeah, asked course. to make these kinds of snap judgments. Right. And it's so funny. Um, you know, you look at films like a few good men, which is such a brilliant film. I, I think no one can watch that and not be powerfully affected by it. Yep. And I'm so deeply moved by Jack Nicholson's character in that film, because of course he's monstrous. Of course he's in the wrong. And of course he is to be punished, but he 100% believes it. Well, not only does he 100% believe it, but he also 100% has a point. And his yeah. point is yeah. that that 
the people who are judging him are not in the position of having to make those life and death decisions. Look, I think in the few good men case, it's deliberately made cut and dry uh, to sort of, um, you know, aid the, the director's case. But there are a lot yeah. of cases that are a heck of a lot less cut and dry where uh, you have similar uh, situations in there. So, so I have a lot to say about that. First of all, so I saw a few good men perform pre-Broadway in Charlottesville, Virginia, because that's where the JAG school is. And the main set was the courtroom. And then there was a wall with concertina wire where Marines were patrolling silently the wall the entire time. Mm. And that was powerful. Mm. It was exactly. very powerful. You know, and, you know what else is in Charlottesville, Virginia? The ENGIC, the National Ground Intelligence Center, where I did a lot of work uh, during my time with DIA. I don't know if you ever spent time there. I did not know about the National Ground Intelligence. What does it's, the National Ground Intelligence Center do? It's, it's exactly what it sounds like. It's tanks, it's rifles, it's infantry, it's, it's anything that goes ground pounding. It's so funny in that when you think of the American intelligence community, all of the stuff that's super secret, the CIA, ooh, right. and, and everybody's heard of it, and right. perhaps the most important uh, intelligence apparatus, and no one's ever heard of them, and they're not secret at all. Things like the NGIC, things like the NIMIC, the National Maritime Intelligence Center. Yeah, yeah. These are the things that give the American military our edge in each of those domains. Yeah, the NGIC, I would argue, is if, if you think the Army and the Marine Corps have any kind of land dominance over another military, the NGIC is a big piece of why. That feels like a feature, not a bug to me. <laughs> that no one that no one pays attention to it, right? And I just ruined it. I just ruined it by talking about it on the podcast. So. Yeah. So... I have now entirely lost the thread of this whole conversation. I do that. I do that, Brian. I'm sorry. <laughs> but I think I think the the what we want to leave our viewers with is that there are you know some kick-ass Christmas movies, but <laughs> Die Hard is the main one. <laughs> oh, this we ended on a slam dunk. And Her number 2, Elf Watch it, enjoy it, yes. drink a toast to James Kahn. Please. Mike Cole, you're going to be back again many times if you're willing. Alex yes. Dean, I hope you're enjoying your honeymoon. Come back and join us. I think we're out. All right, thanks. Thanks.